In this video, I'm covering the topics of setting up the ideal thumbnail project settings, the best practices for exporting the thumbnails, and finally, organizing those thumbnails with proper file management and file naming. I hope you will find it useful. In this quick video, let's talk about the thumbnail dimensions and the proper project setup. When you're inside Photoshop and this window pops up, you should do the following. The original size of YouTube thumbnail is 1280 by 720 pixels, and you're more than fine to use these dimensions for your design. However, if you want to be able to edit your thumbnails in more detail and generally be more flexible with it, I'd recommend going with 1920 by 1080 pixels. These dimensions are also perfect for sharing thumbnails on social media and showcasing them in your portfolios. I know some people who work in even bigger dimensions, but in my opinion, anything over the standard full HD is an overkill that results in unnecessarily large PSD files and exported final images. Anyway, next up is the resolution. You should always go with 72 PPI. Without going into much detail here, 72 PPI, or pixels per inch, is the optimal resolution for images on screen, and it's the standard for online use. Some beginner designers will make a mistake here and put 300 PPI instead, which is what you would go with if the end goal was to print the thumbnail. So avoid doing this as you're most likely not going to print these. And worth noting, any project with 300 PPI will also be a larger file size on your computer. For the color mode, go with the RGB, which is the color space for digital images. And for the bit format of the image, keep it at 8-bit. Anything bigger than this is totally unnecessary for the thumbnail design. Background contents can be whatever you choose. And inside the advanced settings, make sure the selected color profile is the standard RGB. For the pixel aspect ratio, keep it at square pixels. When you have everything set in place, you can come here to the top and press this icon to save the document preset. You can name it something like thumbnail preset and click on save. Now, every time you want to start working on a new thumbnail, just open your saved presets folder and double click the preset to start with your editing. In this quick video, let's talk about the best export settings for thumbnails so we can finally stop seeing posts like this one. Photoshop has quite a few different export methods, but the one I've been using for over six years now is the export as. In my opinion, this is the best export method. When you're inside this window, make sure these four settings are as follows. The file format should always be JPEG. For the file quality, you probably want to select the highest available option. But in my experience, the quality at level five is optimal. And here is a quick comparison. If you have the thumbnail at quality level seven, for this example, the file size will be at around 680 kilobytes. On the other side, if I reduce the quality level to five, the file size will be at only 260 kilobytes. With this, you can reduce the file size by two and a half times while also maintaining the image quality. Let's zoom in on this thumbnail at 200%. There's almost no difference in quality at all. If you reduce the quality level to four, the difference might become more clear. But then again, if you're running out of storage space on your machine, you might want to consider this option. And besides, thumbnails are viewed in small format anyway. So for all I know, you can export these thumbnails even at the quality level one, and there still wouldn't be any drastic difference when viewed on YouTube. However, as I like to share my thumbnails on social media, the quality level of five is my preferred choice. As for the image size, it should always have an aspect ratio of 16 by nine. You can work with smaller or larger dimensions as long as you keep the same image ratio. But in my opinion, 1920 by 1080 pixels that I have here is the ideal size for thumbnails, so I always go with those dimensions. However, if you wanna make your exported file size even smaller, you can reduce the dimensions to 1280 by 720 pixels, for example. And for the end, here at the bottom of the settings, make sure the convert to sRGB is checked. Otherwise, in some very specific cases, your exported thumbnail might look a bit weird. Anyhow, if you apply these same export settings to your thumbnails, you'll never exceed even the one megabyte in file size, let alone the two megabyte limit upload that YouTube has. Bad file management can make you be less productive and go insane very quickly, so try to avoid this nightmare at all cost. This quick video is an overview of how I organize my thumbnail work across five folder levels. Here's level one of my folder structure. It's an overview of everything I do, and I keep the number of folders here to a minimum, ensuring everything is easily accessible. When I click on the business folder, it opens level two, which contains two folders. Clients, where I store all my work, and a folder for invoices, contracts, and other business documents. Inside the clients folder, we reach level three, 
where I have folders for all the clients I've been working with in the current year. There's also an archived folder, which I'll get to in a moment. Clicking on any client folder takes us to level four, where I have folders for each video thumbnail I'm working on. Opening one of these folders brings us to level five, the final level of my folder structure. At this point, there are no more subfolders. Everything I need to create a thumbnail for a single video is located here, including exported thumbnail versions, PSD files, source photos, potential reference images, and more. Now let's take a step back and see how the archive folder functions at the thumbnail level. Suppose there are too many thumbnail folders for hypothetical client A and I want to declutter. I'll select the first four folders and move them to the archive folder, keeping the last two for future reference. The next folder I create will be named 07 followed by the video title. And then in the future, if I need something from an older thumbnail, I can easily find it within the archive. Next, let's see how the archive folder functions at the client level. Imagine these are all the clients I've worked with in 2024. At the end of the year, I'll move the folders of clients I'd no longer work with into the archive, organized by year. For this example, let's move clients B, C, and D into archive 2024. The remaining clients are those I still work with on a regular basis, and they will stay here for the next year as well. Instead of filling in the new folder gaps with numbers 0203 or 04, I prefer sequential numbering for new clients. So when the new client arrives, I'll simply name their own folder as 08. This way, I always know how many clients I've worked with in total, and each number is uniquely assigned, making it easy to find in the archive if needed. If the client C from 2024 returns a year later, I can easily retrieve their folder from the archive and place it inside the active year, where everything is automatically organized by number. And at the end of 2025, when we're taking a break again and I am no longer working with this client C, their folder will be moved to the archive for the year I last worked with them, rather than the year we initially started working together. This makes the process of keeping track of all the clients a tiny bit easier. This quick video was inspired when I saw how some thumbnail designers from the community name their design files. So I figured I'd share my own file naming system just for the fun of it, and of course, because I think it's better. So let's go through the two thumbnail project scenarios. If a client wants only one thumbnail for the video, the file naming is simple. I start with number one for the first iteration, and I continue with sequential numbering for each new version. In this example, file number one was the first thumbnail version I created, and file number 13 was the final one. For the second scenario, where we have two or more different thumbnail concepts, I do as follows. The first thumbnail concept is named number one, followed by sequential numbers for each variation. So the very first version will be 1-1, one, one, then 1-2, one, 1-3, one, and so on. The second thumbnail will start with number two, and the rest of the naming scheme is the same as previous example, 2-1, two, 2-2, two, 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 and so on. And here's another example folder with four different thumbnail concepts. The whole purpose of this video is to showcase how nicely these files can be organized with simple file naming that helps keep track of the editing progress and gives a clear overview of everything. Just for the comparison, look at this nightmare scenario here and then compare it with what I just showed you five seconds ago. The difference is insane. And if you're wondering if I really keep the default Photoshop save name for my PSD files, the answer is yes. If you see my previous video on file management, you've probably come to conclusion it's not important to give custom names for these working files, since we've already done that for each video folder. And just to go back quickly to this first example, if the client later comes to me asking for a completely new thumbnail concept, which we didn't initially talk about, I'll just select all these first thumbnail iterations and format them so it fits my naming policy. After that, I can move on to properly name the new thumbnails.